before we kick this video off, let me just turn and hi Max. All right. So the topics we're covering in this video include cis women's discomfort around a mad people, at least according to Schreier, Caitlyn Jenner, the alleged preferential treatment of trans people, trans people in sports, and another story from parents about their child who surprised them by coming out as trans. Buckle up, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, subscribers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel and this cognitive psychologist look at Abigail Schreier's irreversible damage. We are up to chapter 8, the promoted and the demoted. Good news! After this, there are three more chapters and a sort of where are they now for the people whose stories Schreier has shared. Bad news! To get there, we have to go through some of the arguments we've seen before, plus a bunch of celebrities, bathroom politics, something kind of bordering the disappearing lesbians argument, trans athletics, and Schreier's view on intersectionality. So quick refresher for the visual shorthand to indicate where ideas are coming from. This means I'm paraphrasing the book. This means I'm responding to the book or integrating my thoughts with outside references. There is some science to be had, but on Schreier's end, it's a lot of blog posts and news stories, so nothing new there. Yay. We are going to start this chapter off with a bang, and not a fun one. In 2019, a friend of Schreier's called her up to tell her how poorly her daughter's bra fitting went at a Nordstrom's. Schreier was expecting something along the lines of bad experiences she had had before, but no. But it turned out that the problem had come in a slightly different package. Six feet tall, pancake makeup blurring a stubbled jaw, two breasts grafted onto a muscular torso like add-ons. Weeks later, I headed to Nordstrom to confirm my friend's story. The employee was elegant, attentive, and professional, fluttering around the floor in a tulle skirt, pink manicured nails trailing her every gesture like streamers. But there was no mistaking that this lingerie specialist was assigned male at birth. What would have happened if I hadn't been there? My friend asked me, again and again. What if I had sent her into the dressing room alone and she was too embarrassed to say anything? Not at a Nordstrom. Anything but that. It's too early for this. Schreier, sticking to her word from the author's note in spirit, didn't misgender this employee, at least in pronoun use but then almost immediately goes into an inference about this person's assigned sex, which speaks volumes to her ability to actually empathize or relate to trans and or non-binary people. It's almost surprising that the word burgeoning doesn't appear here. This fits with the gender-critical line of argumentative attack that we need to protect our girls and women from those born with a penis who can't help but be sex pests on some level, that they aren't safe. The scarcity of these sorts of attacks, even in places with non-discrimination laws, should indicate the reality of this implied risk. There's plenty more to say on this topic, but we'll save that until Schreier takes the chapter there. So until then, continuing on. A man may find it hard to imagine just how much mortification attends a typical teenage girl's experience of her changing body. Even in a private dressing room with only women present, Teenage girls cling to their clothing, terrified their perfectly normal bodies might actually be hideous and worthy of scorn. If urinals were made to accommodate female micturition, girls would still never use them. And apparently a woman may find it hard to imagine just how much mortification goes along with growing into manhood. Dr. Mr. The Husband was 15 when we started dating, so the majority of the puberty storm had passed for him at that point. There were still a couple things, like growing facial hair, that took a little bit more time, and that's okay. I was 16 when we started dating, and had been in my adult form for a couple years at that point, so things had pretty much settled out for me. So I've heard stories from him and other guy friends about not wanting to get up from behind the desk to present in front of the class because a certain anatomical part decided right then and there was a great time to test the hydraulics of voice cracks at inopportune times, body odors, hair, just all sorts of things. Mortification seems to be part and parcel of the human puberty experience, regardless of assigned sex or gender. 
In my experience, it takes a bit of mental preparation to be okay changing in front of others, especially when I was younger. In high school gym, I never changed out anything beyond my surface layer of clothes. Like, there was no way that was happening. And fortunately, most days in that gym class, we were just playing cards, so I didn't exactly get too sweaty and I wasn't gross. Um, Using gyms as an adult, it is a bit different. Um, Growing into adulthood, I've sort of lost the ability to care as much what strangers think of me. Uh, So if I am changing at the gym or showering or whatever, I am able to completely change out and be okay with it, but it does sort of have to require a certain mindset for me. Regarding what I'm assuming happened at Nordstrom's, I've never been bougie enough to have a proper bra fitting where somebody is getting in there and measuring me without a bra on, like at Victoria's Secret or whatever. So I imagine that would take a bit of mental stealing of the nerves to get into a place where I'm okay with a stranger doing that to me. So having said all that, I would be totally fine with things like a unisex bathroom. The issue for me isn't so much an AMAB person possibly seeing me undressed or coming out of the bathroom or whatever. It's any person. I'm equally uncomfortable with anybody in that sort of position. So it doesn't matter what gender they are. And as mentioned in one of those articles I referenced a little bit ago, people shouldn't let their guard down when they go into a gendered bathroom. It isn't a safe space where bad things just can't happen. Anyways, we are less than a page into this chapter, so let's move on, with Schreier having a different explanation for what's going on in my tangent. Schreier says the anxious modesty is exacerbated by the potential of being spied upon by the opposite sex, and her example here is a story from the Daily Mail about students staying home when having their periods to avoid the shame because of the unisex bathrooms at school. It's a Daily Mail piece that quotes TERFs to support its claims. No. This feminine embarrassment and shame eases up over time, according to Schreier, and it keeps AFAB youth from having sexual encounters early or before they're ready, and also when they're older, bathroom trips will be less mortifying. What is early? Because kids can have sex pretty young, especially when sex ed isn't comprehensive enough. But even after the shame of adolescence fades, many women refuse to see a male obstetrician. It is, in fact, quite typical for women to prefer that another woman handle their pap smears, annual physical, post-rape exam. To want only a woman to execute any touching that might, in another context, feel sexual. My friend's reaction to the Nordstrom lingerie experience was utterly standard for women of my generation, but it is also quickly becoming outdated. I support people being able to choose their healthcare professionals, and I understand that not everybody is going to be comfortable having a doctor of opposite gender performing exams and whatnot. I did find something about women's general preference in OBGYNs that suggested the apparent preference for same gender doctors may actually boil down to a perceived difference in communication style, as opposed to the gender of who's touching the bits. But to say that the pearl clutching of Schreier's friend is normal for Gen X is absurd. Extrapolating that people her age, or older, are the same as her and her friend is doing a disservice to a huge chunk of the population. Schreier runs down some media first for trans women, from Laverne Cox to HBO's Euphoria, saying that the transgender moment has barreled into us. The cultural discourse is changing to be more accepting of trans people. Oh no? Even Cosmopolitan Magazine, Cosmo, ran an article in May 2016. A Complete Beginner's Guide to Chest Binding, advising youths on the safe and best way to use chest compressors to flatten their breasts. Binding offered me the ability to shove something that was bothering me to the back of my mind and not have to worry about it, said biological AFAB, now trans man, Jackson Tree, according to the article. And Teen Vogue routinely educates girls that gender is a social construct. The truth is, not all women menstruate, and not all people who menstruate are women, One article blithely informs readers, as if that were factual. Not Cosmo, a magazine that, when I was younger, teens read to feel more adult. Although, if they're trying to help trans and or non-binary youth, and they're able to offer better advice than some of their laughably bad sex tips, good on them. Although looking at the piece, Schreier's second reference, it's a mix of decent advice with the more typical Cosmo approach. Schreier selected a quote from the piece's opening where it was trying to give examples from people who bind their chests. The next quote includes some negatives of the practice. The Teen Vogue piece, reference 3, is an op-ed about National Period Day, 
something that's trying to reduce stigma around menstruation as well as make period products accessible. It's also trying to educate the, probably young, reader about the unique menstrual problems faced by trans and or non-binary people. And I am dumbfounded by the last part of this quote. Schreier, supposed respecter of trans adults, wrote that it is not factual that not all women menstruate and not all people who menstruate are women. Trans women don't menstruate and trans men may experience periods. What about this isn't factual? One can argue that this is how it should be. Movies and television and magazines reflecting the entire spectrum of humanity, the gender dysphoric included. But one can't argue that transgender individuals haven't received, in airline parlance, a status upgrade, or that AFAB youth haven't noticed. Apparently status upgrade means being acknowledged as existing and having far too many people angry at their audacity to exist. But it always has to come back to the AFAB youth. Surprise. I'll take a sec to shout out Jesse Gender's video that touches on fandom shipping as a partial consequence of not seeing LGBTQ representation in media. Transgender people are living today with less shame or stigma and less fear of violence than at any point in living memory. That fact should gladden all decent people. Caitlyn Jenner should feel free to pursue a life of her choosing, that most American of wants. But this cultural shift also bears on the current epidemic gripping AFAB youth. A decade ago, one might have wondered, why would anyone except the most excruciatingly gender dysphoric pursue gender transformation? That question can no longer be asked. The person who would pose it isn't living in 2020. Her claim that trans people have less stigma and fear of violence needs substantiation. My sense from trans and non-binary YouTubers and other people I've spoken to is that there's plenty of stigma and fear to go around right now. The rest of this quote's building from the earlier parts of the book and setting the stage for what's to come. Yay. To discover whether, and to what extent, the stigma surrounding transgender identification has lifted in the last decade, I spoke with transgender adults, lesbians, and radical feminists. Here's what I learned. It seems like one of these groups could directly speak to the stigma experience from being trans. It's probably a fair assumption that Trier's meaning cisgender lesbians here along with the assumption that the radical feminists she spoke to were of the gender-critical variety. I could be wrong. I don't think that's the case, but it's still possible. Schreier shares the story of Crystal, a trans woman in her 50s. She had had a hard childhood, thought she was a girl until six, and had been privately dressing as a woman until 2015, when she started doing it publicly. After socially transitioning, Crystal started hormones and had some gender-affirming surgeries. Schreier includes a quote from her indicating that living as a woman is easier for her since living as a man required much more effort. This is basically an aside from Schreier and largely besides a point she's getting to, but I found its inclusion interesting. I would be interested to know Schreier's reasoning for why this is valid, whereas the trans youth she's writing about, the same sentiment is not. Crystal was happy in her gender until Caitlyn Jenner came out as trans, at which point she felt like she was living under a microscope. Schreier says that celebration of transgender identity for many classic sufferers of gender dysphoria is extremely uncomfortable and unwanted. Crystal's gender dysphoria has been an unrelenting source of discomfort. She doesn't want to be celebrated, and she certainly doesn't want to make other women uneasy. In fact, she says, Transgender people's ability to use the bathrooms of their choosing was really no issue until the activists politicized it. I mean, they're cubicles. You walk in, you do your business, you walk out. This statement got me curious about the history of the bathroom issue, so I did a little digging. A commentary in Mother Jones puts the start of the bathroom panic somewhere between the 1970s and 2010-ish. As noted elsewhere, the idea that we need to have separate restroom facilities is relatively new. Something Schreier references later, for a different purpose, indicates that bathrooms became an issue after North Carolina passed its anti-trans bathroom law. So this doesn't seem to be a fault of the activists, at least not the trans-friendly ones. She abhors what she sees as efforts by trans activists to make biological women feel unsafe, and she says the gender ideologue's pseudoscience is nuts. Crystal knows that she is biologically male, she simply feels most comfortable presenting as a woman. I don't think you can throw out the science of DNA just because of people's feelings. More information is not provided about Crystal, which leaves me with a couple thoughts. 
It's possible that Crystal's not being taken out of context and that she's supportive of this book and everything it says. It's also possible that she would object to how her words are being used in this argument, as we saw happen in the influencer chapter with the YouTuber Chase Ross. I bring this up because I don't think most trans and or non-binary people would necessarily disagree with what is being quoted from Crystal. Living inauthentically was harder, Caitlyn Jenner's coming out brought them more attention, the bathroom politics is absurd, and the biology of what bits you're born with is what it is. But the narrative constructed around these quotes is where ideology creeps in, and Schreier's already misled a separate interviewee. Schreier trying to blame the activists for the bathroom bills is pretty fucking rich. The transphobic bathroom bills aren't coming from the trans activists. Seriously. At most, it's coming as a response to what trans activists are pushing for, which is equality and being able to use the bathroom appropriate to your gender, but apparently that's beside the point. What efforts by trans activists make biological women feel unsafe, Schreier? From context, it would seem to be the whole bathroom thing, but as we talked about before, trans and or non-binary people are the vulnerable group here. Also, what pseudoscience exactly? The vast majority of trans and or non-binary people are fully aware of the genetic component of sex. There's proof of that with the terminology used, assigned sex at birth. The only ambiguity coming in there is for intersex people. As sort of implied by Schreier's description of Crystal, their gender expression and identity doesn't map with sex as it does in cisgender people. Crystal, if you happen to be watching this, contact me. I have questions. Schreier wraps up this section by saying that for most trans people she spoke to, Caitlyn Jenner coming out was a tipping point. Schreier goes on to say that this may have helped destigmatize the transgender identity, but it also removed the ability for trans people to go unnoticed. After Jenner came out, Crystal encountered anti-trans hate of unspecified form for the first time, and random people would stop her on the street to validate her in some way. This is something people need to be mindful of for pretty much any minority group. Don't get up in another person's business in the name of support or empathy uninvited. It can be very othering. You're pretty much only making yourself feel good by doing this at the expense of the other person's well-being. From what I've seen, it seems like a lot of trans and or non-binary people's feelings on gender are tepid at best. Especially because for the general public, she is the prototypical example of a trans person. And I think that as awareness of trans and or non-binary people grew, at some point there was going to be a person that would be the go-to example for the general population. If it wasn't gender, it would be someone else. But in the subsequent years, we have seen more celebrities associated with the trans and or non-binary gender identity, Elliot Page and Demi Lovato being the most recent I can think of. Hopefully, this will help to normalize and destigmatize the full spectrum of gender identities and expressions, and get cis people to chill with the unwanted self-serving validation. Schreier notes that Jenner isn't actually the first American transgender celebrity. That distinction goes to Christine Jorgensen. She proceeds to dead name her while discussing her journey from World War II vet to talk of the town care of an interview deal with American Weekly magazine. Schreier's references here mostly detail Jorgensen's experience, with an emphasis on her life after returning to the US post-gender confirming surgeries. One details more of the negative experiences after the initial positive response like people assuming she'd been surgically given the ability to bear children, then becoming angry when she indicated she had no interest in being a mother. Relevant to what's coming in the book, another mentions that Jorgensen's Danish psychiatrist received an influx of letters from AFAB and AMAB people wanting treatment, indicating that this was not as rare as previously thought. Thanks to the Hearst Corporation, Christine Jorgensen became a household name, and sex change operation entered the American lexicon. But gender dysphoria did not make it into the symptom pool, and for all the polite congratulation, few Americans seemed ready to imitate her. Christine Jorgensen, in other words, came out to a very different America. Hey Schreier, your own source is disagreeing with you here. Those letters received by the psychiatrist likely happened because people heard Jorgensen's story and something resonated for them. It's not about imitation. It's about seeing yourself in another's experience and finding words to describe feelings or a sense of self. I know that this is a fundamental argument that this book is built on, that these youth are just imitating trans men for a full variety of possible reasons. 
but to not listen to the people going through this experience and to just fill in your own explanations for why they are how they are. It just seems like bad journalism at the very least. Pivot. By 2015, it's fair to say that America had absorbed a great many cultural knocks. Her heroes a sad lot of castaways as deeply disgraced as they had once been beloved. Take Bill Cosby, for instance. How about we don't? Schreier talks about the Cosby show and Fat Albert, including her memories and connection to them, before mentioning the allegations of sexual misconduct and the shows being pulled from circulation. This book was published in 2020. Cosby was convicted of those charges in 2018. Interesting choice to leave it at allegations. Schreier's other fallen heroes are Lance Armstrong and Michael Jackson. And we're apparently talking about these celebrities because Schreier's setting the stage for why Jenner coming out as trans was accepted. In May 2015, the person we'd known as Jenner came out as transgender to American audiences in a 2020 interview with Diane Sawyer. She hadn't hurt anyone. She'd made America proud, having taken on one of athletics' most brutal competitions, the Olympic decathlon, and won gold. She had never doped or cheated to get ahead, nor did she overwhelm us with her pain. All she wanted was acceptance. It didn't seem like too much to ask. In fact, by 2015, we were happy to hand it to her, relieved at the chance to celebrate a celebrity who struck us, suddenly, as rather wholesome. So she wanted to be a woman. So what? What was so wrong with that? Americans couldn't come up with a good answer. Maybe there isn't one. Maybe, in the scheme of things, transgender is a great thing to be. The author's note is a forgotten, distant memory at this point, apparently. Something Schreier seems to be missing here is that Jenner is an incredibly privileged person. Yes, she had to endure speculation and jokes at her expense prior to coming out because of her position on TV, and jokes because she's trans afterwards, but that has to be weighed against the benefits from her position. She could finance whatever treatments she wanted. She probably had access to the top specialist in helping her with the transition. She could do it at her own pace instead of having that dictated to her by the government or insurance companies. Her family, at least from what the outside could see, was supportive. She likely never found herself in a position where she had to trade her safety for survival. That Jenner didn't overwhelm us with her pain shouldn't be used as an attack against other trans and or non-binary people. But Schreier has a knack for missing the point. Gender dysphoria still appears in the DSM, but it is already on the way out. No longer called gender identity disorder, which emphasized the psychopathology. Homosexuality was once classified as mental disorder too. Most of us no longer believed homosexuality was an impediment to a full and happy life. Maybe appearing in the DSM doesn't mean anything so bad. Maybe it won't be there for long. In any event, by 2013, one in six Americans was taking a psychiatric drug. Who's to say what counts as normal? Maybe we were all a little nuts. I had an interesting chat with Chloe from the Chloe Connection, and the topic of whether or not gender dysphoria should be in the DSM came up. And there isn't an easy answer to that. On the one hand, part of people's experience being medicalized and pathologized can be stigmatizing. On the other, gender dysphoria tends to be associated with some degree of distress and possibly dysfunction, which are rough criteria for psychological disorders. But the argument Schreier's making here, I don't even know where to start. This book has demonstrated her displeasure in the shift from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria, even though that shift was the work of professionals in this field, and done in recognition that different gender identities or expressions aren't pathological just as the removal of homosexuality was done in response to acknowledging different sexual attractions as normal. How can she not see the parallel in her own argument? Reference 9 is a study in the Scientific American that summarizes a study that looked at psychiatric medication use, as inferred from the 2013 Medical Expenditure Panel survey. And yeah, 17% of Americans were filling at least one prescription for a psychiatric medication. Antidepressants were the most common, anxiolytics the next most common. Seeing as how roughly 18% of the US population at any time is dealing with anxiety and roughly 7% with major depression, this medication use rate isn't surprising. But with Schreier's previous inference that a lot of today's psych disorders could have been avoided with a different parenting style, this seems to suggest that the statistic is artificially inflated. 
that people don't really need the psychiatric or therapeutic help. Hard disagree there. One might have thought that this current era of transgender acceptance would benefit all members of LGBTQ, but many lesbians insist that hasn't been the case. The list of instances include closures of lesbian bars and publications, admittance of trans women into a women's only school, allowing trans women use of women's restrooms and locker rooms, housing trans women prisoners in women's prisons instead of with men, and trans women seeking shelter in women's shelters. You may have noticed a lot of things being in the Reference 11 umbrella, despite it being attached to only one claim. Schreier's interpretation of source attribution is back, so let's dig through these in the order they appear in the back of the book. You ready to see the bullshit asymmetry principle in action? Reference 10 is a piece from the National Review on a change to California's prison housing situation, specifically that people will be put in the prison best fitting their gender identity. As per the wiki, the National Review is a conservative editorial magazine that focuses on news and commentary pieces on political, social, and cultural affairs, and is strongly linked to American conservatism. This piece engages in some benevolent sexism, as it argues cis women need protection from those assigned male at birth. It even goes into some of the research included in the bill, that trans women experience far greater rates of sexual abuse and harassment in prison than cis inmates. But then immediately what about to how the vulnerability of cis women to trans women aggressors has not been demonstrated. So far, there have been a couple hundred transfer requests of the 1,129 inmates who identify as trans, non-binary, and or intersex. There's been less than 100 transfers actually carried out, with reasons being given as bed availability, COVID restrictions, and a thorough review process for applicants. But let's take a step back. The bit to not lose sight of, as included in the bill, is that trans prisoners experience higher rates of sexual victimization than the cis prisoners. This National Review piece plays up the potential for sexual predators to play the role to gain access to women, completely neglecting the safeguards put in place that are causing delays for so many of the transfer requests. We'll talk more about this video later, but right now I'm going to borrow an argument from Jesse Gender's video on trans athletes. This argument about what prison trans people belong in is implicitly putting the rights of cisgender people first. Especially with the fact that trans women are experiencing higher rates of sexual abuse and harassment in these settings. Schreier and others are arguing that we keep trans women in a situation where they stand a good chance of being harmed in order to prevent harm to cis women, despite there not being evidence that this will occur, aside from an individual we'll talk about in a sec. Reference 11 makes me wonder if the editor was asleep at the post, as it includes support for claims not found in the sentence it's attached to. Anyways, the first is a Washington Post story about a couple new bars in DC for lesbian, bisexual, and queer identified women amidst the general difficulty in keeping these establishments open. Some theories for why lesbian bars are having a hard time staying open include gentrification pushing the bars out, the on average low disposable income of the target crowd, the possibility that women don't frequent bars as much when in a committed relationship compared against gay men, or possibly the greater acceptance of the LGBTQ community. I'm not seeing how this is the fault of transgender acceptance, Schreier. The next reference is a blog post covering many of the former lesbian-centered publications. In the intro, the author talks about the different ways these were written and funded, noting that these are largely passion projects that exist as long as their creators can continue to put the resources and labor into them. Scrolling through the list, it becomes pretty apparent that the majority of these came and went before Schreier's critical piece of time. Only a handful shuttered after 2010. The author gives a couple possibilities for the life cycle of these magazines, including greater acceptance of the LGBTQ community and the ability of the internet to bring people together. Again, not something to blame trans and or non-binary people for. Up next is a piece from The Daily Caller about a change in an Illinois high school's policy for transgender student locker room use. The Daily Signal is the digital news platform for the Heritage Foundation. The piece includes snippets from a cis teen girl who feels her privacy is being invaded, and a trans teen girl who is happy about the change. How is your privacy being extra invaded by a trans student? Don't answer that. Following that is a reference that should have been attached to Schreier's previous sentence. This is a piece in The Guardian about a serial sex offender sentencing after having raped several women inside of a women's prison and while out on parole. This sex offender, white, sounds like an all-around garbage person. As noted in the Snopes fact-checked for this story, 
White's previous convictions and activities were not properly considered when moved into the women's prison without adequate safeguards. Putting a person in a prison setting where they have access to the general type of people that they previously offended against is a bad idea. This isn't just an issue for trans and our non-binary prisoners. The next reference is about a legal settlement between Anchorage, Alaska and a faith-based women's shelter that refused access to a trans woman. The woman filed a complaint against the shelter with the Equal Rights Commission. The shelter filed a complaint in the district court that their constitutional rights were being violated. The settlement involved Anchorage paying the shelter $100,000 to cover legal costs and the shelter being allowed to exclude people as they see fit. Taking this back to what Schreier said, note her wording here. Trans women are demanding access to women's shelters, not that she was allowed in and some sort of negative thing happened. But again, this has an implicit assumption that trans women in these settings will be predators, and there just isn't evidence of that. The final reference in 11 is another piece in the National Review by the same author, this time about a Vancouver woman's shelter that reserves their services and staffing positions to AFAB people, given the operating belief that cis women are born into an oppressed class. What is it with these women's shelters drawing the line at inferred genetic status? Don't answer that. The final reference for this paragraph is a piece in the Washington Post about the woman-only school, Smith's College, 2015 decision to accept trans women. It includes part of the school's FAQ, which says that trans men and or non-binary people may not apply, although if you transition while attending, you can complete your degree. So yes, these schools have shifted from being schools for females to schools for women. Going back to Schreier's list and running with her logic, it's hard to see how most of these are lesbian problems. The first point, sure, that is specific to lesbians, but the rest affect women in general. And stepping out of Schreier's logic now, codifying trans people's access to the appropriate gender spaces, or shifting to gender neutral ones, is not happening to the detriment of cis people. If anything, denying trans and or non-binary people this access is hurting them because of cis fuckheads. Moving on. But lesbians and radical feminists who object to the idea that identification should grant biological AMAB in all access paths to women's rights and safe spaces are openly derided as TERFs all over social media. That is, trans-exclusionary radical feminists. This might confuse those who have been led to believe that LGBTQ is one community with one set of interests. In fact, gender ideology puts transgender individuals into direct conflict with radical feminists who believe sex is the defining feature of one's identity. Radical feminists like Pippa Fleming tend to regard gender, on the other hand, as trivial, the set of stereotypes society senselessly assigns. They do not believe short haircuts or mannish clothing makes one any less a woman. Women can wear anything they like, they say. Clothing does not make the woman, nor does it make the man. Starting with this safe spaces idea. As commented on in a Time article about gendered bathrooms, this idea that women need a shelter or safe space, in this case in the form of a bathroom, goes back to the Victorian era and boils down to benevolent sexism. That women are the weaker sex and so need to be protected, especially when in a vulnerable position. But as I noted earlier, bathrooms aren't a safe space. Someone for the sake of argument, let's say a man, intent on doing harm is not going to be magically kept out by some force field that's going to just be dismantled if a trans woman is granted access. Reference 13 is the 2015 report from the National Center for Transgender Equality. I have no clue why Schreier cited it here. Is it because it has a chapter on experiences in restrooms? Because that chapter paints a pretty grim picture of trans and non-binary people's experiences in using restrooms outside their home. I think the animosity that can exist between different groups of the LGBTQ community is a pretty open secret at this point. But you know what gender ideology puts the gender-critical radical feminists in conflict with, besides trans people? The general consensus of professional organizations with regard to the separation between sex and gender. And to potentially save you the time and effort in commenting on this, yes, I did see Peterson's tweet on this, and no, I'm not surprised in the least. I will never understand this idea that a person's birth sex being the defining feature of identity as being more freeing than allowing for the idea that gender is a social construct. I think most people Schreier would consider gender ideologues would also argue that haircuts or clothing don't determine a person's gender. They can act as signifiers with how our culture currently works, which may be the part Schreier and others are latching onto here. Like, 
If a trans man wants to be perceived by others as a man, possibly to avoid being misgendered or harassment, possibly to elicit gender euphoria, maybe just to be left alone, a shortcut way to do that is to dress like how men typically dress in our culture, to use these socially constructed cues to non-verbally say, dude here, how about we all just stop worrying so much about how other people are choosing to dress and style themselves? As long as they aren't doing harm, like say a flasher would be doing, why are some people getting so upset about this? Don't answer that. According to Pippa Fleming, an African-American lesbian performance artist, the 90s were the golden period for lesbians in the States, but they've since had to go underground, and the different bars and organizations have had to operate in this low-key and gate-kept manner because they're trying to keep access restricted to cis women. Schreier doesn't really indicate why this is the case though, which is kind of surprising since the section's called the Forgotten L in LGBTQ. Just turfs exist, some lesbians are going underground to be able to keep trans women out, and moving on. From the title, I honestly thought that this section was going to go into the disappearing lesbians or lesbian erasure ideas, that the trans agenda is trans and kids who would have otherwise been lesbians. If you aren't familiar with those ideas, Dr. Jamie Raines has a video on this topic, which is included in the description box. In the last part of the section, Schreier says that several adolescents she spoke to indicated that coming out as trans gives you more social street cred than coming out as a lesbian. If somebody is adopting an identity or expression purely for the social cred, it probably won't stick. Schreier says that the promotion of trans women has come at the cost of women and girls. She doesn't say cisgender, but cisgender. Place your bets now for where you think this argument's going. I'll give you a second and a cute video to do so. Okay, ready? Biological AMABs identifying as girls are already overpowering the very best high school girl athletes across the country. AFAB runners, swimmers, and weightlifters are being routed by trans-identified AMABs many of whom are only middling athletes on the boys' team. Those who object to the unfairness are either dismissed or accused of bigotry. If you saw teen sports coming, congratulations. The lack of a ding on the last sentence was because the next portion of this book is one particular example, but we'll get there in a sec. Jesse Gender has a very thorough video on trans people in sports at the youth or adult level, so I'm going to refer you her way for a larger discussion here. The distilled version is that this is a complex issue, but there are a couple points to consider. First, there needs to be a discussion on what is considered the most fair. Barring trans athletes altogether is not fair for them. It's actually a form of discrimination under Title IX. Having trans athletes compete in the competition category assigned at birth will put trans women in with the men, which will be at their detriment as many will have undergone at least a year of hormonal treatment but it will also put trans men in with the women, which will give them a testosterone advantage. Second, the onus for demonstrating that trans athletes do have an unfair advantage is on people wanting to prevent them from participating. Third, many organizations like the NCAA or the IOC have guidelines in place for athletes and criteria trans athletes have to meet to compete. In the case of the IOC, for example, one woman who later found out she was actually intersex was removed from competition because her testosterone levels were above the cutoff. Finally, many of the smoking gun instances of trans athletes that are frequently pointed to as dominating their field don't when you get into the specific stats and records. With that out of the way, let's get to Schreier's references here. Reference 14 is a piece about trans athletes, arguing that allowing them to compete is hurting cis girls and women. I also want to say that this title is disingenuous. It isn't boys competing on girls' teams, it's girls competing on girls' teams. This is on PJ Media's website, which had this helpful pop-up when I went looking for the About section. You too can help fight the good fight and not let the left win by becoming a premium member. This article brings up a couple of the recurring examples I mentioned a little bit ago, a couple of high school runners and an MMA fighter. With regard to the runners, some of the competing students sued several of the involved school boards and trans students, but it was thrown out by the judge. It's also worth mentioning that one of the plaintiffs had won in a race against one of the trans athletes a few days before the lawsuit was filed. For the MMA fighter, we're talking about Fallon Fox. 
Five wins and one loss seems pretty good, but this website has a top ranking for people in our weight class, so let's take a look at their stats. The top bantamweight, according to Sure Dog, is Amanda Nunes, who has 21 wins and four losses, with the majority of wins coming from TKOs. Next is Jermaine Durandamy, with 10 wins and four losses, and the majority of wins being called by the judges. Last I'll cover for this list is Holly Holm, who has 14 wins, 5 losses, and most wins again coming from a TKO. I'm not super well versed on MMA fighting, so I don't know what's average, but it seems like in the couple we looked at, a lot of wins are coming down to who knocks the other person out first. And that's even the case for Fox's loss against Ashley Evans-Smith. Yes, I pulled a trick on you. This is actually Fox. The first picture I showed for her actually belongs to Juliana Pena, ranked ninth on the website. Part of why I did that is because of some of the transphobic commentary surrounding Fox's time competing, as discussed in her Wikipedia entry. Also discussed in that is a medical doctor's statement that trans women's body composition, post-hormonal treatment, is essentially weaker than a cis man's, and that there are strict criteria potential competitors have to meet before being allowed in the ring. As discussed in the aforementioned video by Jesse, it doesn't appear that trans women athletes are hurting cis women athletes, at least not to a larger degree than other cis women athletes are. Reference 15 is a Swimming World magazine story on Natalie Fahey, covering her decision to transition partway through college to be able to compete authentically. This cost her a year of competing to be able to meet the mandatory minimum year on hormones. Looking at her posted swim times on SwimCloud, and the top times for that year, it seems like she's not close to risking dominating the field. Finally for this quote, reference 16 is used by Schreier to support weightlifting being dominated by trans athletes in high school. The kind of funny thing here is that when we talk trans women weightlifters, we're pretty much talking about New Zealander Laurel Hubbard, born in 1978. Schreier's use of this piece is a bit strange, as it details the lawsuit with the runners and the NCAA and IOC rules for trans competitors. It even includes a comment about how much of a non-issue this actually is, aside from the handful of controversies. So altogether, it doesn't seem like trans girls or women are overpowering cis girls and women in sports. Bafflingly, from her own sources and what sport they were attached to, only one actually talked about people at the high school level. And this underhanded comment about these students being middling prior to transition blatantly insinuates the real reason behind these people's transition, according to Schreier. All of which is to say, girls have likely noticed that they've lost favor in the broader culture. Their private spaces turn co-ed, their sports records stolen, their protestations of unfairness shouted down as bigotry. What favor, Schreier? What are you talking about? I assume this co-ed private spaces is referring to the bathroom issue, which just, no, it's still a woman's restroom. Show me proof of these records being stolen. And as included in Jesse's video, the protestations do sound a lot like bigotry. Schreier's example of someone being canceled is the tennis player Martina Navratilova, who wrote a piece in the Sunday Times saying that trans athletes had an unfair advantage. One of her sponsors, Athlete Ally, dropped her. Reference 17 is a write-up of what happened on NBC News' website. And oh, did Schreier underplay what Navratilova said. Her op-ed is largely behind a paywall, but the title is The Rules on Trans Athletes Reward Cheats and Punish the Innocent. To quote another YouTuber, What can I say but yikes? The quotes included in the NBC piece aren't any less yikes. With those sorts of comments, it's little wonder that Athlete Ally dropped her, as discussed in Reference 18. The statement also mentions that she was warned a couple months prior after a tweet of similar sentiment. But, of course, Schreier isn't having any of it. If Navratilova, perhaps the world's most prominent gay female athlete, could be branded an anti-LGBT bigot for having stood up for girls, how could unknown girl athletes object? What chance do they have to be taken seriously? For so long, sports have offered women and girls the chance to excel, to gain scholarships and professional opportunities, and to feel rightful pride in all they could do. Suddenly, it seemed the game was fixed. If they had objections, no one really wanted to hear them. Seriously, check out Jessie's video on this. She gives a far better rebuttal than I can give time to here. Quick and dirty version. Navratilova's statements are bigoted. Girls and women can still do sports and achieve and all of that. They just have a little extra competition now. And objections with merit are still valued. What does this have to do with the transgender craze of AFAB youth? 
if women can no longer be defined according to physical characteristics or biology, how are we to define them? Prominent transgender author Andrea Long Chu has an answer. Female is a universal existential condition defined by submitting to someone else's desires. A more offensive or insipid definition of womanhood could hardly be imagined, but in order to redefine womanhood to include trans women, this sort of solution has become typical. Bereft of biological markers to explain who counts as a woman, trans activists rely on social stereotypes, many of them archaic or insulting. Schreier has more to say about the biology later on, so we'll hold off on that for now. Reference 19 is about the source of the quote, Andrea Long Chu, and her book, Females. Reading that, it becomes pretty apparent that there is a load of context Schreier dropped. The opening description pins Chu as having a sharp tongue and an irreverent style. The context surrounding the quote Schreier pulled includes the argument that everyone is female, an example that tries to explain how dominance is in itself a form of submission, and that she is not saying anything new by saying everyone is female. I can't really say how prominent Chu is as an author, so I pulled up her Wikipedia to get some idea. It seems like her writing is polarizing. It is interesting to see critiques that mention the risk of her writing being used by anti-trans arguments, saying that female is a universal existential condition and that dominance is submission honestly feels like too deep for me stuff. But it seems that Schreier trying to frame this as a typical solution for trans women to include themselves into womanhood is a huge fucking stretch. Even in the context of the author's quote, it's not just that trans women are female. In Chu's writing, everybody is. Still, Schreier's coming back to this argument that biological markers determine gender. Anything else is stereotyping. Speaking of... In this way, women's biological uniqueness is denied outright all reference to our specialness stripped with the acid of intersectional language. Pregnant women are increasingly referred to as pregnant people, and the word vagina replaced with the hideous phrase frontal. The more inclusive language strives to whitewash the feminine nature of anatomy that trans-identified AFAB adults would prefer to forget. You can shove your biological uniqueness up your front hole, Schreier. Yes, pregnant people and friend hole are more inclusive language, but I don't think the language police are coming for anybody's pronouns or what they call their reproductive bits. From the website that directs to what Schreier referenced, this is a comprehensive sexual health guide for transgender and gender expansive people and their partners, put out by the Human Rights Campaign Foundation and Whitman Walker Health. It does include a definition for friend hole, which seems to be trying to defeminize that part of anatomy. Although, looking at this in its entirety, it's almost surprising Schreier didn't key in on the definition of vagina as also denying the uniqueness of women's biology. I don't think this is trying to rid the world of the word vagina. It's just providing terminology for people who don't want to call that part of the body that. And with regard to pregnant people, I don't think the implication of this shift is a mandate for everyone in how they refer to themselves. Someone who is currently making a baby and identifies as a woman can call herself a pregnant woman or a pregnant person, like it's her choice. This is more for referring to the collective group of people who are pregnant, which includes trans and or non-binary people. I don't think this is about AFAB trans and or non-binary people wanting to forget the feminine nature of anatomy so much as shifting language to not make existence so tightly gendered. More items on Schreier's list of, quote, trans-inclusive language derogating womanhood. People who menstruate, breeders or bleeders. This language then reduces the ability of AFAB youth to want to grow up identifying as women. I remember the lead up to when I started menstruating. I wasn't sitting there in eager anticipation of when would this start for me and I would become a woman. I was hoping it wouldn't start for as long as possible. I didn't want to deal with a monthly shark week, having to take the red convertible out of the garage for its monthly drive. The regular visit from Aunt Flo. Fuck that noise. I know this word has been done to death at this point, but I would physically cringe when relatives would cheekily tease me about how I was growing into a woman and things would soon change. I would want to have babies and wear dresses and all of the other things that I was supposed to do as an adult woman. Contextual note. The only time I've worn a dress in the past 20 years? is when I was a bridesmaid in a friend's wedding. I didn't wear one when I got married, in a judge's office. My point is, 
Maybe if the language had been less stereotypically gender loaded, I wouldn't have been dreading things so much. Reference 21 is a tweet from NPR about the menstruation tax. Reference 22 is a blog post from Jonathan Van Maren, who advertises his book, The Culture War, at the bottom of the post. His description of the book says it includes topics like the sexual revolution, hookup culture, the rise of the porn plague, abortion, commodity culture, euthanasia, and the gay rights movement. I'm sure it's a hoot. The post itself is commenting on a commentary about a comedian who tweeted for a charity trying to help with period costs, with a tweet including the term bleeders. She was run off Twitter for using the word, and this vlog's author rhetorically wondering why women would take offense to the term. Schreier seems to have overstretched this reference as it makes no reference to breeders. This is my life now. Why are some people so upset about making the language around menstruation more inclusive? I mean, I know on some level it's about changing tradition and we can't be doing that, and also it's transphobic to the core, so why die on this hill? For the breeders part, I don't think that's necessarily a trans thing aimed at pregnant people. I think it's sort of enmeshed in the child-free community or movement as a term for people, sperm or egg provider, who reproduce. And as far as bleeders go, as a cis woman who bleeds on a monthly basis, I've always found that hilarious. It's not wrong. Schreier pivots to talking about modern porn bad, choking during sex bad, consensual breath play bad. There's a lot here that seems kind of besides the point and fear mongery, so we're going to skip to the bottom of this thread. Quote, if you have trouble seeing the appeal of transgender life, consider that the typical dating life available to young women today doesn't look half as great as it used to. There is something to be said in trying to make sure that kids aren't able to get their hands on the hardcore stuff. And also, porn addiction is a thing. But I think the focus here should be on education and other proactive approaches rather than demonizing anything beyond vanilla sex. Safe, sane, and consensual are pretty good guidelines when interacting with others even outside of romantic entanglements. Normalizing people having dialogues about what they are comfortable and interested in doing before getting to business seems like it would help prevent some of the situations described here. Hammering home consent and what happens when a person violates that consent is so, so important in helping people recognize relationship red flags and getting out before it gets worse. But we're not going to talk about any of those things. We're talking about porn because, apparently, it's making AFAB youth not want to pursue a cishet romantic relationship. Sure thing, Abigail. Schreier reminds us that the majority of the sample in Littman's Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria paper were white. And this is, apparently, possibly, the, quote, most reviled identity on today's campuses. Depending on what circles you run in, I think showing up in a MAGA hat or Crowder merch might win out. They can't choose to be people of color. Most can't choose to be gay. Nor can they choose to be disabled, though they might be inclined to milk whatever setbacks they have endured. Most? Most. Schreier! You want to talk about milking setbacks? There's a perennial joke based on reality, about the elders complaining about how things were in their day, where they had to walk uphill to school, in snow, both ways. Uh, the joke's not coming from nowhere. Weirdest instance I saw of this. At my husband's family reunion, my father-in-law was reminiscing with his siblings about how, when they were younger, they would have to go out into the backyard and pick a stick that they were going to be disciplined with, and kids these days have it too easy, yada yada yada. You know, if they came back with a stick that was too thin and they thought it would go easy on them, they'd get hit with it and then they'd have to go back and pick a different stick. Yay! Of all of these badges of victim status, the only one that you can actually choose is trans. Heather Haying, visiting fellow at Princeton University, pointed out to me. All you have to do is declare, I'm trans, and boom, you're trans. And there you get to rise in the progressive stack, and you have more credibility in this intersectional worldview. We are past the halfway point in this book. She's just letting the transphobia out all naked and unashamed. But it's okay. Visiting fellow at Princeton Heather Haying said this. Princeton! Just, we're not going to talk about the evergreen part right now, it's not relevant. Princeton! 
Why is there this assumption that intersectionality comes down to oppression Olympics and victimhood? People have been mistreated and have legitimate grievances to discuss, and the nature of this mistreatment can vary depending on what group or groups you belong to. All sorts of shit needs to get sorted, but some issues are a bit more pressing than others. Schreier, via Haying, argues that students are falsely identifying as LGBTQ because of peer pressure, as 40% of the students at Evergreen identified as LGBTQ when surveyed in 2017, then 50% in 2020. Haying says this number is high because, across cultures, LGB, T not included, is 10%. Reference 28 is a story on a Western Washington's public radio website about the large proportion of the Evergreen student body identifying as LGBTQ or questioning. It notes that, despite the overall drop in enrollment, the number of LGBTQ students has grown. Gee, it's almost like the school might have cultivated an atmosphere that's enticing to some people. And it's also not the case that LGBTQ people are equally distributed around the world. There are some countries or cities that are more friendly and tolerant of GSRM people, and so they're more likely to live there. I mean, San Francisco is just down the road from me. Also, something to keep in mind is that the students in school are largely Gen Z, who are identifying as LGBTQ more than other generations. And it's not fucking peer pressure. More acceptance and awareness means more people getting to live authentically with an understanding of what they're experiencing. Virtually everything that transgender activists hope to achieve in the broader culture has already been achieved on college campuses. While the broader American culture endures constant flogging, LGBTQ identities enjoy a non-stop parade. The universities revile privilege and facilitate emancipation from it too. All they ask is a de minimis sacrifice to the intersectional gods. Your birth name is a good start. With this paragraph, Shire would fit right into the drama department. I'm not saying that universities are perfect, or that this hasn't been taken too far by some professors or students. But as we've seen more recently with critical race theory, privilege is a theory trying to explain an aspect of how our society functions that has been pulled out of its context and turned into a culture war battleground. My impression is that many universities have worked to build a more inclusive environment for its students, but that hardly seems like a non-stop parade where you have to become something you aren't for acceptance. Schreier says that UCLA gives students forms and instructions on how to change their name on campus, so their parents won't find out, and legally, as does the University of Pennsylvania, with the comment that this all can be done as quickly as leaving a review on Amazon. I poked around the website for reference 29. UCLA's LGBTQ Resource Center, and I'm not sure where Schreier got the idea that any of this could be quick. The Resource Center website includes a link to the registrar's office for changing your name at school, and the process for doing it in California. The process in California requires you to fill out some forms, file those forms with the court clerk, plus paying almost half a grand, publishing the name change in a paper for four weeks, going before a judge, and finally getting the name change decree. Shreya then talks about how many schools include hormones and possibly surgeries in their student health insurance plans. It fucking better if it costs anywhere near as much as what I was having to pay for student insurance when I was in grad school. Shreya ends this section with a hypothetical story of a student who transitions in college, and it's basically the story that she ends this chapter with, so we're just going to go there. Quick reminder, because it's been a little bit since we've had one of Schreier's parental story times. When she's talking about these stories, she uses the name that the parents use for this person, as well as the assigned at birth gender. So because I don't know how these people are doing, what they would like to be called, we use an initial and they them pronouns. M wasn't a tomboy as a kid, had a boyfriend in high school, and played sports. They struggled freshman year of college and were depressed over Christmas break. Sophomore year, a roommate took them to the health clinic where they were treated for a nervous breakdown. M's parents picked them up from school and they took a medical leave that semester. They took some summer classes to try to catch up, but showed up back home at some point later with a shaved head and a new penchant for secrecy. Their parents were concerned, felt that they should have just been resting, but didn't want to press things. Junior year, M joined a club of unspecified activity and another student suggested they were trans. M told their parents this other student was correct. M changed their name and started testosterone. This upset their parents, who told them as much. So, M cut contact. 
The parents thought about physically taking M home, but heard from other parents that if they tried that, they'd be escorted off campus by security. They thought about cutting M's tuition, but were afraid they would drop out and never come home. So, instead they called the school's administration, arguing that M wasn't stable enough to be making these sorts of decisions. Seemingly breaking things like HIPAA, the head of the health center told them they use a gender affirmative care model and do what they can for their transgender students. M was an adult, their mental health was under control, and they consented for the treatment. But their parents knew M was unstable and was permanently changing their body. So they showed the dean texts from M to show what they considered instability. They told the dean they were okay with M transitioning, just not right now. The dean wrote back that they understood the parents are concerned about their kid, but M had decided to do this and the school's health center was following current medical standards. M's parents couldn't sue the school, so they just had to despair over what they were doing and feel betrayed by everyone at the school who were helping them. I feel like we're paying for them to ruin our child's life, M's mother told me. The school in question is the sort of place whose logo parents dream of placing on their car's rear window. Now, M's mother would prefer to watch the place burn. There isn't really anything new to M's story that we haven't seen in the previous parental stories. They were girly as a kid, they'd had a boyfriend, coming out as trans was a shock to the parents, and so forth. And it doesn't really tie in with the things Schreier discussed in this chapter. I'm not sure why she included it here. But that's enough mystery for today. The next chapter focuses on puberty blockers, hormones, and surgeries. Oh my. Until next time, bye!